Thank you so much, Kitty. It's wonderful to be back here, and it's wonderful to be with the ambassador of Saudi, of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, Her Royal Highness Princess Rima bint Bandar Al Saud. I think I got that right. You got it. <laughs> um, uh, I wanted to ask you about uh, so many things in foreign policy involving the Kingdom, the Middle East, the region, the United States, U.S.-Saudi relations, but just to tell you that the royals are no different than all of us. Princess Rima, the ambassador, lost her luggage and still has not seen it. <laughs> and can I tell you the worst part? The airline has no clue where it is, but I have Apple AirTags, so I know it's in Seattle. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> so... <laughs> and coming from where she was working on their Saudi application to be the... Yes, International Expo, the Bicentennial yes. Exposition, which is done by the Paris Exposition uh, uh, Decision Making. So from Paris to Aspen, yes. the luggage is in Seattle. You figured that out. Who knew? <laughs> so sh there are stores in Aspen, so let's just say. Thankfully, I think I've uplifted the Aspen economy. <laughs> um, so you have been the first woman cabinet minister in the kingdom, yes. the first woman ambassador. And I wanted to ask you about women's rights and human rights more broadly, because there are still women in prison, there are still women uh, who have been, you know, protesting against the situation. There has been liberalization, women can drive. Uh, many of us who had been in the kingdom, you know, back decades ago, never expected to see that. The liberalization in part of male guardianship mm -hmm. has taken place. Where do you see this evolving and how is it for you as a woman to see this change? Well, the reality is there's no perfect situation and what we're working on as the kingdom, regardless of whether it's women's rights or laws writ large, is we're in the process of evolution. Part of Vision 2030 that the Crown Prince has designed and that we have been actively working in says, how can we be in a better state for not just to be a thriving and ambitious nation, but to create opportunity for not just our young people who are young men, but women included. That means we've had to do a full overhaul of the legal system and the justice system specifically. And as many of you are aware, legal change takes time and unfortunately, it's never as fast as the situation needs it. But what have we accomplished? Since 2016, when I joined government, guardianship has been dropped, which means a woman, myself, can represent herself. I will tell you, when I left the kingdom in 2019 to be our ambassador in July, I needed my father's permission. August 19, women were liberated. And I am today a woman who is 48 years old, mother of two, can represent myself, I can have full authority over my children, open a bank account, travel. Our age of maturity is 21 for women, but it's 21 for men too, which means for you it's 18, for us it's 21. A woman can have her passport, leave her home, travel, get on a plane, book a hotel room, take a job, any job, equal pay for women, self-representation, no discrimination in the workplace. Now, none of that is new or marvelous, but it's phenomenal for a woman who never had that. And I am that woman, regardless of a royal title. Are, are those, those rights conferred equally for women? Absolutely, throughout equally. The kingdom? And they were taken away equally, by the way. So prior to these law changes, it didn't matter whether you were royal or not, wealthy or not. You were just a woman. Whereas today, you are a woman who can represent herself. But that change doesn't mean there's perfection. And what you do need to recognize is today women have legal recourse. But that doesn't mean the mind of her father or her husband or her brother or the men of her community have changed. Mindset shift takes minimum 10 years. So the fact that we've been able to shift from the time that we were in, which is yesterday, to where we are today is shocking. And any of you who've been to the kingdom before would know, you would have had to cover up and you would have felt a little bit uncomfortable everywhere you went. Today, the doors are open for women. And it's now on us to prove who are we. We owe this space to ourselves and we owe this space to the next generation of women. So how we behave, how we function, how we present ourselves, how we challenge ourselves is a part of opening the door for that next woman. Now, part of this change has been having the first Saudi Arabian astronaut in space. Yes. 
but at the same time, there are other, there still are human rights issues, Absolutely. many of them. And, and not only are there human rights issues, there will persist to be until the laws change. And that's why we have a fight against time because nothing makes my life harder or hurts my heart more than knowing someone has been arrested for something that in reality, in the rest of the world might not warrant it, but because of the way the law is written, they are arrested. And that's the unfortunate situation when you're in flux, when you're in development, but you're still operating at the same time. And so, yes, you'll see a headline tomorrow. And many headlines may be indefensible, but what I will defend is the fact that we are working and working aggressively hard to do it, not because someone's forcing us to, but we have to, because we owe ourselves that and we owe the next generation the right to live in a country that they feel comfortable and secure in, where they know that the law that is being applied in the Northeast, where we do have a Shia community, is the same law that's passed in the center of the country, which is the same law that's being passed in the south of the country. And you will be judged based on the crime or not, not based on arbitrary emotional engagement of a judge who has not followed a canonized law. Canonizing law is the goal, and it's critical, and that's the goal. There has been criticism of the Saudi entry with a lot of money into live golf and soccer, that that is a way of distracting attention from some of these problems. Sure. So I, I hear that a lot, and what I'll tell you all is, Welcome to the architect of the sports economy for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. I was hired in 2016 to be the president of the women's department. My role then was to find women, include them in the value chain of sports, and to write the regulation that allows women to participate. So in 2016, we rewrote regulation, or introduced regulation, I should say, that is our equivalent of the Title IX that allowed women to walk, run, jog, participate in any sport and every sport. PE and girls' schools, and women in broadcasting of sports, women to be seen playing a sport, and these are the same women that were told it was shameful before. And very quickly what we came to realize is this inclusion of women into the sports economy, yes, it created jobs for women, but that lack of job and lack of opportunity also existed for our young men. And we also had a challenge, which was the four non-communicable diseases, osteoporosis, hypertension, heart disease, and, um, what was the last one? I think it was osteoporosis, hypertension, heart disease, but you get where I'm coming from. The point is, how can we get more people to participate in sports? How can we get young people to believe a sport is a job and an opportunity? How can we change the mindset of young people from being sedentary to be physically active? You can't be what you can't see. So what did we decide? We had a sports sector that had 9,000 jobs exclusively for men in, in soccer. We said, we must create federations, increase sports, increase community sports activities. So we aligned ourselves, not just with the Olympics, but with TAFISA, the Global Sports Organization, for community sports engagement. And we began to encourage young people to participate in sports. But here's what we found out. In the same way that LA Galaxy realized when you bring David Beckham, more people fill your stadium, more people want to come and work in sports, more people want to be encouraged and engage in this ecosystem of this environment of sports. Messi's going to Miami, exactly the same thing. We have Cristiano Ronaldo in Saudi, a stadium that used to have only 30,000 viewers, today has 60,000. Not just men, but women also. We have a few other players coming in, and it's a free market. And we learned the concept of the free market from here, by the way. <laughs> Let me ask you about the, uh, your foreign minister's high-profile trip to Tehran yes. last week. Um, the Iranians have opened uh, an embassy in, or a mission in Jeddah. Yes. Uh, when will this, the kingdom open an embassy in Tehran? We're working on it. And a lot of people questioned why, after all of these years with all of the tension. But when we also talk about Vision 2030, it's not just about the social and cultural change in the country. It's about de or re-engaging in the region. How can we? bring tensions down. Now, Iran, I don't need to repeat history for you. Yes, it's attacked us. Yes, it has had malevolent activities, not just towards us, but towards you. But what would it look like if we were more hopeful? What would it look like to the conversations that we were just listening to to say, 
Let me see what I can do to make sure my youth and your youth can live better, can have more opportunities. And their youth and our youth will not thank us if we don't take this opportunity to listen to each other and try to work together. It does not mean they agree with us with everything we do, and it doesn't mean we agree with them. Yes, we're still concerned about nuclear. No, we're never going to transgress any international law, regulation, or resolution. But we feel we owe it to our neighborhood to de-escalate. And it's not just with Iran. It's exactly why we're having conversations with Syria. We have millions of displaced people, and the status quo hasn't worked. We're looking at displaced people who could be the second group as large as the Palestinian displaced nations that are in Jordan, they're in Syria, they're in Lebanon, they're in Turkey. These people deserve to go home. And so we, as the Arab League, have said, by unanimous consensus, what would it look like, rather than the status quo, if we did engage and tried to do this better? And if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, and we go back to where we were. But we owe people a chance. This... It was China that negotiated this rapprochement, and China has been moving into the region mm -hmm. in, in big ways. Uh, do you see that as a vacuum left by the United States? No, not really, because we're supremely and ultimately aligned with the U.S. and U.S. policies, uh, particularly when it comes to regional activities in the Middle East. But if I could also share, we had already done negotiations through Iraq. We've done negotiations through Kuwait. We've done negotiations through Oman. We've done them directly. And so I think one of the most important things is to keep trying. Because if we don't keep trying, we will create these assumptions about what other people think. And it will not lead to a healthy resolution. You do not want a nuclear Iran pointing itself at the rest of us. You don't want us poking and prodding. You don't want Israel poking and prodding. You don't want the Iranians aiming at Israel. You, do, you don't want any of that. We see what war looks like. We see it with Russia and Ukraine. Why would we not take that moment and step back and say, we think there could be a better way? And we fundamentally, as the kingdom, believe diplomacy should be the first track, not violence. Does that extend to supporting China trying to mediate between Israel and the Palestinians? We support anyone who's willing to talk to anyone. It just is the right thing to do. Could you see... Can you see China also trying to negotiate between the kingdom and Israel? You know, the kingdom has a policy, which is we believe in a two-state solution. We want to see a thriving Israel. We want to see a thriving Palestine. Vision 2030 talks about a unified, integrated, thriving Middle East. And last I checked, Israel was there. We want a thriving Red Sea economy. We want our African partners and neighbors to thrive. That is the ultimate goal. But the resolution has to come with equitable, equitable peace and dignity of living for both parties. I don't think there's any Israeli mother that wakes up every morning celebrating rockets coming over. I don't think there's one Palestinian mother that celebrates her son or daughter losing their life for this conflict. It's been too long. And I'll tell you, my father was our ambassador for 23 years to the United States. I mourned those 23 years. Those were 23 years. He lived on an airplane, and many of you who've known him in this room know he dedicated his life to solving this situation. So nothing would give me more pleasure than to be Saudi Arabia's first female diplomat in the United States of America and see a resolution to the Palestinian-Israeli crisis, because it's a crisis that robbed me of my father. And so I want to see it ended. But when we think about Vision 2030 for an integrated Middle East, how phenomenal would it be for any of you here who have a Jewish faith, who've gone and done trips to Israel, to actually feel more safe going to Israel? How many Muslim people in this room or friends of yours who are Muslim would feel wonderful to be able to go to Bethlehem and pray, or to Jerusalem, or to land and go to their home and see where their grandparents were? What a beautiful story would that be on the Ideas Fest in Aspen, Colorado, to have somebody tell us that story, and I hope I live to see that day. Can you imagine normalizing relations with Israel while the Netanyahu government is taking such aggressive steps and taking more and more land for settlements from the Palestinians and making it impossible to have contiguous land to create a Palestinian state? 
It's so terrible. It's so problematic. And I wish, I wish I had a say in it, but it's not anything I have a say in. So again, let's take the steps back to what we listened to earlier. If we just asked people the question of where are you coming from and why do you want to do this, we might get to a more stable, workable solution. But we can't just take for granted the fact that each each party understands where the other is coming from. We can't take that for granted. And I think the conflict has gone for so long that these walls have been built psychologically and emotionally that are very hard to overcome. And call me naive, but I think it's time for people to have faith and hope in humanity and to address conflict with that spirit, and I don't think we are. And so I really will tell you the settlements are problematic and the kingdom has spoken out very publicly about this and it does make it more difficult for people to take those steps but i will tell you people talk about normalization we don't say normalization we talk about an integrated middle east a unified middle east that becomes a block like europe where we all have sovereign rights and sovereign states but we have a shared and common interest so that's not normalization normalization is you're sitting there and i'm sitting here and we kind of coexist but separately. Integration means our people collaborate, our businesses collaborate, and our youth thrive. Well, there are flights now, you know, over flights, there's connections now there and travel, but could you recognize Israel diplomatically as long as the government of Israel is taking so much land from the Palestinians? Look, I think it's problematic, and I think it's something that we're trying to solve. And it's something that we and anyone who has a hope for peace should want to see resolved and should want to see pulled back and that's the kingdom's position we don't think it's helpful we don't think it's just the kingdom wants the u.s to support a civil nuclear program for saudi arabia uh, if that does not happen would that be a deal breaker for proceeding towards normalization with israel you know, the kingdom has aligned itself with the U.S. We come to the U.S. for our technology. We come to the U.S. for our education. We come to the U.S. for our future. And the reason why is this country, 80 years ago, is the country that opened the door to our energy. You came through your energy companies and unlocked Prosperity 7, which was the well that today is the pipeline and the source of what Aramco is and the lifeblood of the kingdom. So we'll always come to you first. And we'll always come to you first because we believe that you don't only take, but you co-create because that's what you did with us. So whether it's nuclear, whether it's education, whatever the subject, we will always come to the US first. But if we do not supply Saudi Arabia with the nuclear technology, would you get it from someplace else? There are plenty of places. Honestly, I think that's too big a conversation to debate today. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I would say America is always the first port of call. The ceasefire in Yemen has now held for a year. Yes. And there are hopes of reaching a more permanent end to hostilities of that terrible war. Um, if that would happen, do you think you could get the U.S to lift the ban on selling offensive weapons to Saudi Arabia? Look, we've always had a debate. What is the difference between offensive and defensive? And anyone who likes football will tell you that the best offense is a, or best defense is a great offense. Today, if missiles are being shot across the bow, are you better served having to be right, taking down every single missile, or are you better served taking down the launcher? Because you could have a thousand missiles and not one's gonna take off if there's no launcher. So we would debate and perhaps present, we would all be better served getting rid of launchers than having to shoot a missile out of the air because we would have to be right every single time, whereas the individual launching only needs to be right once. Has the US offered you those assurances? We're still in conversation, to be honest with you, and it's something I discuss daily, not just with the White House, but the State Department, and I'm on Capitol Hill, and that's the proposition that I make. But I will tell you, there have not been hostilities with Yemen or shots across the bow. For over a year, we've not had kinetic engagement. And so I would tell you the goal is peace. But when somebody's thinking about 
taking a shot across the bow. They do think twice if they know you can hit back. It just is what it is, it's human nature. And if any of you have had a son who's in school who gets hit by a bully, when you hit the bully back, it's not what the principal wants you to do, but they don't get hit back. If somebody knows, you can stand up for yourself. And that's our ask. We're not asking for your boys and girls to come across our borders. We're asking you to allow us to defend ourselves. You mentioned Syria earlier and all of the displaced people. I've been to some of those refugee camps and seen also how Russia and Damascus have bombed those people out of their homes. And it raises the question, uh, Assad has used chemical weapons against his own people. The war crimes are profound. Yes. Um, yet he's been invited back into the fold of the Gulf Council. Uh, is there to be no accountability for what Assad has done? No, for sure. So part of the re-engagement is to say, what can we, as an Arab League, create as an environment that allows for a safe return? But what does a safe return look like? Today, there's the Caesar Act, so there's very strict boundaries, by the way, as to what can and cannot happen there. And that's why conversation and communication with the U.S. is so absolutely critical, and with Europe, to understand what are the boundaries we can operate in. We need to build homes again. We need to create basic infrastructure so these people can come back to. And that question is asked, is that humanitarian or is that enabling Bashar? We would tell you that's humanitarian because the people living in refugee camps, I assure you, would rather be back in their home with running water than another freezing winter in a camp. That's not a dignified way to live. And in that process, what can we do in our negotiation in our engagement with him to create a safer environment because the status quo hasn't worked. It's been 12 years, 12 years where it's not just a war zone. It, the country is a shambles. We cannot have another failed state in the Middle East. It just, it's, it is unreasonable to let it happen. And so the question is, what do you do? And that's what we're trying to solve for today. Now, Saudi Arabia cut oil production on the eve of Secretary Blinken's recent trip. And that was viewed as an effort to uh, play up to Russia, frankly, and keep oil prices high, which benefits Russia, uh, tilt towards Russia. And then the Crown Prince also made a, a call to Putin in the aftermath of that trip. Um, how do you see the kingdom's balance between um, the US and Russia, especially, given yeah. Russia's invasion of Ukraine. So interestingly, OPEC is made up of actually 22 countries. And the role of OPEC is to stabilize and keep consistency in the energy markets. And that's what we do. And that protects a consumer and it protects a producer to be able to project. And today, with the adjustments that we've made, you can project for the next year what the oil price will be. And we think that stabilizing is the right thing. With regards to outreach to Putin, I'm not sure if you're aware, but through that outreach, we were able to get five hostages, 10 in fact, out of Russia, back to their countries, to the US, um, to Europe, I believe one was to Morocco, if I'm not mistaken. And we voted with the United Nations majority to condemn the aggressions. We believe in sovereignty. We believe in the rule of law. And we don't accept transgressions in what we've seen, but we also believe somebody needs to talk. Somebody needs to engage. Otherwise, things will keep escalating, and we believe in being a mediator, and that's what we offered. We invited President Zelensky. He came and addressed the Arab League. We also invited uh, President Putin. He didn't come. We've given over $400 million to aid to the Ukrainians. In the initial conflict, we gave over $10 million through Poland to allow for the refugees to come and go. And we have a commitment to support Ukraine because it's the right thing to do. And we have a very, I would say, constant policy of being mediators. We've done it in Lebanon. We've done it in other conflicts. We're mediating in Sudan. And we believe that diplomacy and mediation is the better way to try to stop aggression. And what we see today is something that we should learn from, because clearly the world hasn't learned from the conflicts of the past century. And we now have conflicts in the Ukraine. We have Sudan. And our, our vision is to have a stable and coherent and thriving world rooted 
in diplomacy, not in conflict. And that's why we view ourselves as a mediator. Well, I just want to thank you very much for having this conversation. It's in the interests of all of us. <laughs>